You might not realize it, but mathematics can unlock incredible power. You can use it to make your dreams become reality. Mathematics is a powerful tool for exploring life on Earth and for discovering our place in the universe. Mathematics is changing the way we play our games, the way we think about ourselves. It's the fuel that's driving the information age. This is mathematics like you've never seen it before. Major funding for this program comes from the National Science Foundation. America's investment in the future. And the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to increase understanding of the application of mathematics in everyday life. Additional funding provided by the McDonnell Douglas Foundation and the Alcoa Foundation with exclusive corporate support from Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments is proud to partner with the education community to create the calculators that help children do extraordinary things. Because the more our children can get out of math and science, the more they'll get out of life. I'm thinking of a problem. It's a geometry problem. Imagine a surface. I can measure its area, but it doesn't have any edges. You got that? It has a finite area, but no edges. What is it? It's not a square. It's not a circle. It's none of these. They all have edges. The one I'm thinking about doesn't have any. I'm thinking about a spherical surface, no edges. See? A sphere is a pretty interesting surface. Why? Because we live on one. Since our species first walked the planet, we've been exploring the surface. We invented mathematics to help us. In fact, geometry means measuring the Earth. For thousands of years, we've used mathematics to measure and map the planet. In fact, we'd be lost without it. I think most people take maps for granted. People who make maps don't at all. Nigel Holmes is a map maker for Time magazine and newspapers like the New York Times. His maps link millions of readers to places and events across America and around the planet. The kind of maps that I do, they're going to say, um, this is where the explosion happened. Uh, this is where the plane crashed. That's the kind of job that I do. Maps actually show relationships between things. That's what I like about them. And very concrete relationships. They show you the edges of things. They show you where you are. I'm a bit of a nervous traveler. So one way that I'm going to calm that down is at the very least is to know where I am. If we can see something in front of us, we do feel more relaxed about it. I'm going to show you the perfect map. Ta -da. It's a globe. Uh, it's not flat at all. It's perfect because everything is in the right proportion to each other and there's no distortion. 
But if you wanted to use this as a map to get you from uh, New York to Washington, you can barely see that there's any detail in there at all. Actually, you'd have to go to something enormously bigger than that if you wanted to see the detail. Maybe to something like this, although even at the size that I've got this thing, uh, there still isn't enough detail for you to see New York to Washington. What's more, I feel slightly st stupid coming into the room here with this and saying, uh, OK, love, we've got the uh, map, now let's go off on our road trip. The perfect map would be exactly the same size as the thing that you're mapping. Obviously, you don't do that. You make a scale version in which one unit on the map represents many units on the ground. And it's this mathematical scale that gives a map its authority. It gives the reader of the map the belief that the map is really going to get them from point A to point B. Mathematical scale solves the size problem, but getting rid of distortion is another mathematical challenge. So here's the problem, what we uh, professional cartographers refer to as the orange peel problem. You want to map what's on the outside of it onto a piece of flat paper. If you take the skin of the earth off it, and put it down on the ground, it's not flat. It isn't a flat thing. I mean, as much as you try to flatten it, it, it uh, kind of sticks up. And this is the problem that all cartographers have to deal with, all people who make maps. It's a basic geometry problem. Over thousands of years, cartographers have devised clever formulas that describe how points from one surface can be transferred to another. Some project these points onto a cylinder. Others project them on a cone. Still others project points directly to the plane. But there's no perfect way to flatten the Earth. Every projection has some distortion. A famous example is a map made by Gerardus Mercator in 1569. Any line drawn across it would show a constant compass direction, and for centuries, sailors used it to chart courses around the world. Mercator's become synonymous with map. Mercator equals map. Most schoolrooms had Mercator projections in them. People even knew the name Mercator. I mean, he was a famous person. An example of the uh, huge distortion on Mercator maps is shown here with Greenland. Uh, Greenland is actually the size of Mexico. And so you can see how enormous it's got here because of the distortion of the particular projection that was never meant to show the relative sizes of the countries, was meant as a navigational tool. There are all sorts of maps, some good, some bad, some quirky. But all of these start from somebody measuring something. The way you represent that measurement, that mathematical measurement, uh, can take so many different forms that the scope of the word map is enormous. Sarajevo. Okay, last start there. Yeah. It's exactly 42.7 miles at uh, 024 degrees. Okay, short flight. Roughly about 50 uh, mile flight. When you're racing around at 500 miles an hour at low altitudes, the more you know about where you're going, the less chance you'll you know, make a mistake or, or miss the target. And especially at night in uh, adverse weather, it's very, very critical to know where you are and where the, the train is. Over centuries, the science of map making has become very sophisticated. 
tell pilots rehearse their missions, the military uses mathematics to make what may be the most realistic maps ever made. I do think of things mathematically in some cases because you've got to build, in essence, models. And as we all know, when you build a model, there are certain mathematical equations. You've got to build a model of the airplane, which simulates what the airplane actually does. But there's also a very complex mathematical model of the Earth, a three-dimensional model of what the terrain looks like made up with equations, figuring out how high and how fast your airplane can climb over the terrain. Satellite images and intelligence data are layered like pages of a book. To create a map that looks as real as the ground it represents. At the heart of the flight simulator is a mathematical model of the Earth's surface, which is created at the National Image and Mapping Agency. Satellites and aircraft passing overhead record images of the Earth below. These images overlap and are linked together by common points to form a large seamless picture. The geographic location of the picture is determined by the lens size in the camera and the location of the satellite measured by tracking stations on the ground. As the camera passes overhead, it photographs each location from two angles. By comparing the difference in perspective, computers can determine the elevation of the land at 100 meter intervals or posts. Using this technique, the agency has collected elevation data for 90% of the Earth's land surface. The terrain data is the math model that gives us the hills and the valleys. It's a mathematical representation of the Earth, which allows us to do several things, a couple of which are to locate ourselves precisely on the Earth overlay imagery, tie it down precisely, put our intelligence information, our operational information, our planning information, and get that to the people who have to have it. Everything ultimately is tied to the earth. And the mathematics is transparent to the user, but is, you know, the, the basis for everything that we do. In 1995, the flight simulator was put to the test. Vic Kuchar and the support team helped NATO pilots plan airstrikes against targets in Bosnia. Two months later, peace talks began. Kuchar helped the negotiating team to create a new role for this technology. All of these people on a 24-hour day basis would come to us and we would fly them, virtually speaking, to Bosnia. They had to have confidence that this mathematical model was ground truth. Attention focused on the city of Gorazda, which was claimed by the Bosnian faction. To establish peace, it was critical to link this isolated pocket to the Bosnian homeland. In order to connect these two, we had to, to find some agreed upon corridor. So we physically, on a map, laid down yardsticks and said, here's our, our corridor, what do we have in there? Anything that you can gain inside of your line will add to your total wherewithal, a stream or a power line. Now here's an example right here. This valley belongs to the Serbs. 
and you can see how we had to deliberately pull this thing at 90 degrees out and away from this valley. Uh, so there was some strong negotiating there, you can bet on that. The one leader asked me to fly him to this one little town. And as we were going down through a valley and there was a little uh, stream crossing there, uh, he said, can you hold here? Which I did, I stopped the machine. And he said, uh, see this bridge? I used to swim off of this as a boy. Seeing that reinforced, I believe, in his mind that uh, this, this data was real. After four days, the quarter boundaries were established and the warring factions reached a settlement for peace. There was a lot of tugging and stretching of that rubber band line between the two entities. But the terrain visualization equipment, our math model and data allowed us to fabricate this corridor, unlike anything ever done in history as far as I know. The mathematics that was harnessed for peace is the product of thousands of years of measuring the Earth. Geometry means measuring the Earth. It's, it's a Greek word. The Greeks were the first to realize the Earth is not flat. It takes the form of a sphere. For us, it's such a commonplace, it's hard to realize what a leap that was. And to picture the Earth as this gigantic ball floating out in space and people on the opposite side hanging upside down by their heels, that was very, very hard to conceptualize. The Greeks had this mystical idea about circles. They notice that if you look at the path of stars during the course of a night, they'll form a circle. And then, of course, the moon is a perfect circle, as is the sun. Circles and spheres, both, seem to be a very essential part of the way the universe was constructed. When the Greeks were noticing that as you move further north, the North Star seemed to be higher, and the sun would look lower in the sky and the reverse in the south, they at some point realized that the reason for that must be that the Earth is spherical and not flat. By getting this geometric framework, they were able to really understand the reasons for what they observed. Long before we went to the moon, you could draw an exact map of what the Earth was going to look like when you got out there. Maps have become one of the central notion of mathematics. They started out with a very concrete problem of taking a portion of the Earth's surface and then drawing a picture of it on the plane where you have an overview of it. You have two different domains, and you're transferring the information from one to another. And that notion is now called a map. With the mathematical tools, the Earth has been surveyed in greater and greater detail. But not long ago, many places were still unmapped territories. In the early 1930s, there was an awful lot of North America that was still just plain blank on the map. And there was an area there of around 5,000 square miles uh, between the Yukon Territory and Canada. And all it said, very neatly, and I'll never forget it, in little lines, uh, high mountains 10 to 12,000 feet high. And nothing but that in blank, blank white paper. So we told the National Geographic if they wanted to finance an expedition into the area that we would go in there and find out what's there. For thousands of years, explorers like Brad Washburn mapped the Earth by standing on its surface. But in Yukon Territory in 1937, Washburn helped map making take a giant leap. 
This was my first uh, really deep connection with using airplanes. I had a rope around my waist that you tie back across the other side of the cabin, and there'd be enough slack in behind you so that you could actually get out the door of uh, somewhat and take a, an absolutely straight down picture. It was cold in there, you know, it was 20, 25 below zero in the cabin. On the other hand, we were young and tough and we got used to it. We took large numbers of photographs of the terrain as we flew over it. Then we went in on the ground, going in in, in March and getting out in June. With a clear overview, Washburn and his colleagues could quickly locate key survey points, which allowed them to survey the ground with great efficiency. We put in a rough network of angles that would show you more or less where big mountains were, more or less how high they were. To chart new heights, Washburn's team used simple trigonometry. By marking two points and measuring the horizontal baseline, they created a vertical triangle. They could then measure the angles from each point to the peak. With these three measurements, they could calculate the height of the mountain. The work on the ground gave you a framework on which you could hang the aerial photographs. Using a mathematical technique called photogrammetry, Washburn was able to turn his photographs into maps. Using the camera as a geometric measuring tool, he has charted large areas too rugged to map from the ground. On wing and foot, Washburn and his wife Barbara have mapped some of the Earth's highest peaks. We started out by taking pictures for mapping purposes, but then in the midst of all this, while you were taking pictures for a purpose, every so, so often you'd say, whoops, that's beautiful. Let's take a picture because it's just beautiful. I think the, the big fundamental difference between today and a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago is that the explorer today uh, has to be a much, much more technically trained person than you were in the old days where you could just snowshoe uh, into areas <laughs> that nobody had ever seen before. Because we're living in a technological world. Seventy percent of, of our planet is made up of water. We have better images of the surface of Venus and the moon than we have of our own ocean floor. I am a geographer who likes to study the ocean floor. I'm very interested in areas on the ocean floor where the floor is either spreading apart or converging together. I'm very interested in, in going down and actually seeing the seafloor myself in submersibles. Usually the areas that, that I study are anywhere from one and a half to three miles in depth. It's not like I can just go out my front door and go to the Juan de Fuca Ridge and walk around for a little while and gather some data and go back to my lab. So I'm interested in very active areas where there are lots of volcanic eruptions, lots of earthquakes. There's a tremendous amount of heat released from the, the surface of the earth. 
That's very important in terms of, of global climate. It's important for me to be able to take back maps of what these areas look like because I don't know when I'll be able to get back again. Mathematics is extremely important for making uh, accurate maps. The, the good thing about it is that you don't need to be a hardcore mathematician to do it. An instrument is mounted on the bottom of a research ship, sending out these pulses of sound. But we just need to know how long it takes for the sound to get to the seafloor and return to the ship. We convert the travel time to distance or to depth. And that basically shows us what the seafloor looks like. Yeah, this is a, a map of a, a volcano that we discovered on June 5th during our expedition. This portion here used to be a lot higher than this surrounding ridge, but at some point in time it collapsed. And so this is a, a bowl. This is seen much more easily in 3D. There are incredible trenches and uh, canyons on the seafloor, like the Grand Canyon. There are these incredible mountains. I can see where faults or cracks in the, in the surface of the earth are. Every time I look at a map, I see something a little different. It's very exotic. You know, you're making maps of places that, that people have never been to. It's basic exploration of uncharted territory. Scientists can get stereotyped as geeks a lot of times, I think. <laughs> and it's um, a lot of us spend a lot of time in laboratories and on ships doing our science, but uh, a lot of us also enjoy doing other things. The most important thing for kids who want to explore the earth nowadays is they, they have to really uh, love the earth and, and be excited about it. I think Jacques Cousteau said that people protect what they love and, and, and I'll add to that that people protect what they understand as well. To understand the Earth, we have used mathematics to measure and map the surface. But finding one's location on this surface has always been a challenge. Since ancient times, navigators have looked to the stars to find their way. The problem we're talking about is the problem of a ship at sea that doesn't know where it is. Or at least it doesn't know where it is well enough to avoid running onto something hard and pointy. So uh, what GPS does in a very economical way is give you the answer to that problem. GPS, the Global Positioning System, is a constellation of navigation satellites. Brad Parkinson directed the effort to design these satellites and put them in orbit. Basically what the ancient, uh, more or less ancient navigators would do is measure the, the so-called elevations of stars, which is the angle from the local horizon up to a star or other heavenly body. 
And in order to have that particular angle, it turns out there was a circle on the Earth that only could have that angle. And by mathematically working that out and looking at several of these bodies, they found their intersection at, in essence, arcs of these circles. GPS doesn't do that at all. The math is quite different. And the results turn out to be quite a bit better. Next exit on the right, followed by flight right turn. Using distance measurements instead of angles, GPS is revolutionizing our ability to navigate the Earth. We should be going beneath the underpass in the relative level. Should be loop road. A new system links a car's real-time location to a digital map. A mapping team is checking important details by comparing the display to what they see out the window. Left turn ahead. And that would be Cortland. And it is a one-way southbound. We're good. As the car winds through a maze of freeways, an onboard receiver detects radio signals from satellites 11,000 miles overhead. Clocks in each satellite are synchronized with each other and broadcast coded time signals to the Earth below. The car's receiver compares the arrival times and computes the distance to each satellite. Each distance defines an imaginary sphere around each satellite and pinpoints the car's location within several feet. Please proceed to the highlighted route. To locate the position of the car, the location of the satellites must be known precisely at every moment. Lieutenant Crooks. Could you verify that the SVN 9 pass is scheduled to start at 1900 for a stored state of health? At Falcon Air Force Base in Colorado, two dozen GPS satellites are monitored on orbital paths first described by Johannes Kepler over 300 years ago. Math is at the heart of this system. Kepler, of course, worked out several laws, and these laws reflect how spacecraft move in orbit. And he discovered things that were mathematically very elegant. They move in ellipses. But satellites do not move in perfect ellipses because the Earth is not a perfect sphere. Over tall mountains, the pull of gravity increases. Over ocean depths, the pull is less. These forces cause satellites to drift up and down several miles from their elliptical orbit. What GPS has shown itself able to do is predict within meters where the satellite will actually be. That mathematical description is stored in the satellite and broadcast to the user. In essence, the satellite is hollering down, I am here, I am here, and the user says, yes, now that I know you're there and I know what time it is, I can sort out where I am. Ahead. With GPS, timing is everything. Onboard clocks are built to measure signals moving 186,000 miles per second. These clocks are stable to the point they lose at a rate of no more than one second in 300,000 years. Why do you need such accuracy? Because they are basically timing a signal that's being propagated with the speed of light. One billionth of a second, or a nanosecond, is equivalent to one foot. Modern man takes a lot of things for granted. Man in the 17th century could no more conceive of going faster than a horse than flying to the moon. 
Well, what has now happened is we have a new power. That power is knowing where you are. Left turn ahead. I would categorize the math that's embedded in this, as elegant and wonderful as it is, as another example of something that the modern man will take for granted. It's invisible. Someone can push a button. The math is embedded in this little chip. It gives us our answer. Here we are. With mathematics, we have mapped the Earth and created heavenly bodies to guide us across its surface. Understanding the Earth's geometry has made the planet a familiar place, and scientists are now using this knowledge to explore a realm that is far less familiar, the universe itself. The Earth is uh, sort of flat, but you wouldn't notice it if you're coming up this road. <laughs> yeah. uh, but on the big scale, of course, uh, if you look at a globe uh, and the mountains are all to scale, they're barely tiny little uh, ripples on the surface. The Earth, uh, even though it has relief on it, uh, on the big scale, what it really is is, is, a, is a sphere. It's the same sort of thing when you're doing an astronomical measurement. So you come to a place like this where you have the big instruments and where observing conditions are very good uh, because we want to work on very faint objects so we can measure big chunk of the universe, a big enough chunk so that it begins to reveal uh, its geometry. For the Greeks, the challenge was to discover the Earth's shape without seeing it whole. Modern astronomers face a similar challenge. Many scientists, including Einstein, have theorized that the universe may be curved, like the surface of the Earth. Robert Kirshner is taking measurements that may reveal this actual shape. We don't have a ruler that we can stretch from one place to another, so we have to use a, a more indirect distance measuring tool. Kirshner and his colleagues are mapping sections of the universe. Like other map makers, he needs mathematics to deduce one measurement from another. You can take a picture of a star or a galaxy and you can see its shape, how it's distributed on the sky. But one of the more uh, powerful tools that we have is to take that light and run it through a prism or a grating that spreads the light out into a little rainbow and then measure how much light there is at each color, how much blue light, how much green light, how much red light on into the infrared. We can measure from the light emitted by the galaxy uh, whether it's coming toward us or away from us and how fast. So we're all familiar with that effect. When you hear a car zooming by on the highway, uh, you know that it, it makes this sort of mm, sound. It goes from a kind of high pitch mm, to a low pitch mm, as it goes past you. The same kind of thing happens with light. A galaxy that's approaching us has its light shifted to higher frequency. That means to the blue a little bit. And uh, a galaxy that's moving away from us has its light shifted to the red. By analyzing the color of galaxies, Kirshner can estimate their distance from the Earth. In the 1920s, astronomers discovered the universe is expanding. Most galaxies are moving away from us, and the farther they are, the faster they move. Therefore, a distant galaxy will have a high red shift, and a nearby galaxy will have a low one. Kirshner and his colleagues have measured the red shift of about 25,000 galaxies observed in narrow windows of the night sky. Their data forms a three-dimensional map. At the center is the Earth. The edge is three billion light years away. In 
In some areas, galaxies cluster together. Other regions are dark and empty. Like mountains and valleys, these are important features of the cosmic landscape, but small details in a map that shows a tiny slice of the universe. The neighborhood is very complicated, but that's just the local detail. We have to go pretty far out, just as if you were mapping on the surface of the Earth, you'd have to go pretty far away before you'd see the effects of curvature. In the same way, we have to go not 800 miles, but 5 billion light years to begin to get really significant effects that we might be able to measure. And the tool that we use is uh, the apparent brightness of exploding stars. The exploding stars are very bright. For a period of about a month, one of these things is as bright as a billion stars like the sun. The stars exploded five billion years ago. The Earth is only about four and a half billion years old. That means these stars exploded before the Earth even formed. So while the light was on its way, the Earth formed, life began on Earth. Here we are, we built the telescopes, we got up to the top of the mountain, and you know, we're able to see it just as the light arrives uh, on some particular night. These stars are called supernovae, and when they explode, Kirshner can measure their brightness. From their color, he can also measure their distance. To look at the relation between distance and brightness of supernovae, you can imagine what that would be like in flat space, that as you go farther out, the things you see get dimmer and dimmer. The brightness is down like the square of the distance. The inverse square law tells us the lights of similar brightness will be one-fourth as bright when they are twice as far away. But if we see some deviation from that in the brightness of these things as we look at them at bigger distances, that means that the underlying geometry is different. In nearby galaxies, Kirshner has measured exploding stars and plotted the results on a graph. If the brightness of far-flung supernovae is the square of their distance, then the universe is flat. If it is not, it must mean the shape of the universe is curved in some way. To answer the question, Kirshner and his colleagues must collect light from exploding stars far across the universe, pushing the most powerful telescopes to the limit. Searching the night sky, Robert Kirshner waits patiently to measure faint traces of ancient light. I think we're really on the path here, uh, unless there's some joker in the deck that we haven't come across uh, yet. I think that in the space of a couple of years, we'll have at least a preliminary answer to the question of uh, what is the geometry of space. Some people think they already know, but we're engaged in this uh, tremendous adventure of trying to measure it. We're sort of at the stage of the Greeks understanding the shape of the Earth. And that's because we're working on things that are really at the limit of technology today. An astronomer explores a fundamental question about the physical universe. The invisible universe of mathematics allows him not only to calculate the answer, but to imagine the question in the first place. All the centuries of progress with mapping the Earth and with the mathematics associated with it allows us to think about mapping the universe and understanding the pictures that we come up with. You look out there, you see these galaxies, different distances, different directions, but you can't put them all together without the geometry to analyze what it is that you're seeing. The geometry of curved space, now used to model the heavens, was developed in the 1850s by George Frederick Riemann as a result of measuring the curvature of the Earth. 
the Greeks were the first to realize the Earth is not flat. And Riemann sort of did the equivalent thing for space. He said, well, possibly all of space is a three-dimensional version of the spherical shape of the Earth, which is the two-dimensional surface, and he wrote down an equation. Calling Riemann a genius, Einstein used his geometric equation 75 years later to explain his theory of relativity. The big contribution of Einstein was to basically equate Riemann's geometry of space with the physics of the universe so that all of 20th century cosmology really grew out of Riemann's idea of higher dimensional curved spaces. Understanding these geometric properties continues to this day. Ooh, look at those beautiful tools! All right. Neat. We have a nice garden here. We're born into the world. Everything's a surprise to us. We go out, we want to see what's there. And asking about the shape of space is just asking about this largest scale, saying what's the, what's the playground that we find ourselves in here? What's, what's the shape of, of the whole thing? In the physical universe, curved space is a possibility. But in the mathematical universe, it is very much a reality. And Jeff Weeks has devoted his life to exploring it. Even though this quest for understanding the shape of space is a relatively new question, it's part of an intellectual tradition that goes back thousands of years to the Greeks. Our mathematics is, in a sense, space metry instead of geometry. Rather than just measuring the Earth, we're now going and measuring space. We're trying to develop mathematical models that explain what we see when we look into space. Like a biologist classifying new species, Weeks is cataloging the shapes of three-dimensional space. Each is a model astronomers can use to test their observations. Among thousands in this library, one may someday be found to be the shape of our universe. I've written the computer programs to increase what we know about the mathematical universe. So it's. It's like this big world filled with these creatures. I mean, not physical creatures, but mathematical creatures. And we want to learn something about them. We want to learn how they're related to one another, what the patterns are. There are these beautiful interconnections, and we just don't understand all the details. Curved spaces have properties that are similar to the Earth's surface. A person going in one direction will eventually return to the starting point. Although the Earth's surface is a finite area, someone can travel forever in any direction without ever reaching an edge. The same can be true of curved space. It's going on its way. The central mystery is how you could travel off in one direction and come back from the opposite direction. In two dimensions, this is easy enough to understand. Think about the two-dimensional universe, an ant's universe, as it were. If one of these creatures starts off in some direction, they'd imagine they just keep going forever. What else could possibly happen? But there are other possible shapes their universe could have. It could be a cylinder, like the, the trunk of a tree. Okay, so if an ant starts walking in what it perceives as a straight line around the trunk of this tree, it'll come back to its starting point. Yeah, pretty strange, huh? It's harder to visualize how three-dimensional people in a three-dimensional universe could head off into one direction, travel straight the whole time, and still come back to their starting point. To help people imagine a ride in curved space, Weeks and his colleagues created a video that depicts a bizarre journey. We're starting with a solid cube of space. We want to think of opposite walls of this cube as being glued to each other so that any creature moving out one wall will come back from the other wall. 
similarly going to the top and the bottom, the front and the back. So this hooks this cube up into a space which has only a finite volume, but it has no edges. You can travel wherever you want as long as you want. You'll never hit any edge, but there's still only a finite volume to the space. From the spaceship's point of view, the tiny universe repeats itself endlessly with no perceivable edge or boundary, much like what the earthbound ant would see going around and around the tree. The cube is a simple case, but in all cases, curved space is connected to itself, which implies that if our universe is curved, it has no edges. The central idea here, the really, you know, the exciting idea is that space could connect up with itself. Faces with the same color are connected to one another so that a spaceship traveling out one face would come back in another face with the same color. So it's, a, it's like tab A goes in slot B. That's sort of instructions for assembling your space. Okay, let me turn off snap B here. Through computer games, Weak shares his knowledge of curved space with his son. Well, the reason for writing a game is to give kids something where they can subliminally absorb what this space is like. You want to go first? I'm white. Yeah. My son Adam, even when he was a preschooler, he'd look at some of these games like the Taurus chess, where you'd go off one side and you come back from the other side. And this was absolutely no problem for him. When you're three or four years old, everything in the world is a surprise. Everything's new and wonderful. And, and why shouldn't it behave like that? Hmm. Does that mean that I've won because all you have is your king? I think that means you won. I'm also in check here. Yeah, I will concede. Good job. Wow. Oh, cool. That's grass, right? Yeah, it's not normal grass. I really like working as a consultant. I can do my work in the morning, and when Adam gets home, we have a chance to have a few hours together each day. That's an important thing for me. It's nice being able to do it. I think no matter what he ends up doing for a living or what his interests are in life, seeing some of these beautiful aspects of nature, the real nature outside, and then also the beautiful aspects of mathematical nature can only make life richer. There are two domains of exploration here. There's the real universe, which we explore physically with telescopes. And then there's the mathematical universe that we explore with our minds, with using the computer as a tool, with pictures. Real nature is beautiful. If you go out and you look at a flower, or you, you look off into space, it's a miracle that we have this physical universe to explore. I think it's no less a miracle that we also have this mathematical universe to explore. It's full of beautiful, intricate patterns lying there, waiting to be discovered. For centuries, we have explored two universes and discovered that one leads us back to the other. We have developed mathematics to explore the Earth and to map and navigate its vast surface. Exploring mathematics, we have discovered models that enable us to envision the universe. Our journey of exploration may be a voyage like Magellan's that never seems to end 
but may someday bring us back home where we began. To learn more about the Life by the Numbers series, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Exclusive corporate support for this program comes from Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments is proud to partner with the education community to create the calculators that help children do extraordinary things. Because the more our children can get out of math and science, the more they'll get out of life. With major funding from the National Science Foundation, America's investment in the future. and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to increase understanding of the application of mathematics in everyday life. Additional funding provided by the McDonnell Douglas Foundation and the Alcoa Foundation. To order a video of this program, other programs in the Life by the Numbers series, or the companion book, please call 1-800-274-1307 or write to the address on your screen. This is PBS.